You are listening to the Savage Fincast, episode 73. Enter Kettle Corn. Chicago. A criminal mastermind called Overlord held our city in his terrifying grip. Ordinary cops were losing the battle against Overlord's super freaks and mutants. Then, a miracle happened. When I found him, he had no memory of his past. I helped him find an identity and a life. Now we have a fighting chance. Now we have the dragon. This is the Savage Fincast, the show that just got back from a Comic Con, and boy, is its arms tired. <laughs> I am the world's oldest millennial, Jim Purcell. I am Craig Olson. Hey, Craig. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> Liar. I'm Raven Perez. We are flying duo today. Uh, Craig is out of the country. Mm-hmm. He's on a special assignment. And when he comes back, um, I think you'll all be very happy with what he brings back to the show. He'll be, he'll be all about that lucky Luke and that Tin Tin and <laughs> Asterix. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Savage who? Uh, <laughs> Savage Dragon. <laughs> he's not in France, is he? I don't know where he is. I think he's in Europe. He's he's a bit like Carmen San Diego, that Craig Olson. He's all over the world. We don't know. Globe Trotter. We have no idea. We don't know. He's maybe, he's just, maybe he's just with family across town. We don't know. He's bigger, bigger than us. More important. We're just humble little guys. Definitely Hold more him. successful. Possibly <laughs> handsome. Possibly. I've seen him in person. He holds up. Although, Raven, you got that pretty boy thing going on. <laughs> Should probably be in movies. Well, you know, home movies, maybe. <laughs> no, nothing in Hollywood. I don't know. It's fucking good, though. It's going to be a good one. I got to say, we got a shit ton of awesome stuff going on in this we, one, even yeah, we, if. We got a couple of things we're going to talk about to fill the time. Of course, we're going to be talking about uh, Savage Dragon uh, 2, 30, <laughs> seven. 37, 237, yes. Scourge, so good. But, uh, you know, real quick, we're going to have a fun little uh, tangentially related discussion about Blood Strike Brutalies by yeah, one yeah. Michelle Fife. Do you say brutalists? Brutalists? I say br- I don't know why I keep saying brutalies. I say brutalists. It is brutalists. I just okay. in my head it became brutalies at some point, and now I just said it out loud, <laughs> and now I realize my mistake. <laughs> brutalies sounds like uh, fancier. Is all. Blood strike brutalies. <laughs> all right. So right off the bat, my experience with blood strike was mm-hmm. zero. Zero um, blood strikes were known by me. I knew nothing of the series. I have the weirdest uh, connection. What about you? I have the weirdest connection to it because I didn't have apparently apparently I didn't have no connection to it. Because as I was reading this, um fucking I was remembering characters and stuff. I just didn't stick with it as hardcore as the other early image titles. Um okay. like Youngblood, Spawn, and Savage Dragon, I was all about. Blood Strike, I guess it's weird because I knew a lot of these, like the chick with four arms stands right. out in my... Uh, I mean, I recognize the characters vaguely from, mm-hmm. you know, various Liefeld creations because for whatever reason, like, yeah, the, the forearm chick and the Wolverine looking guy. And the robot, dude. I always thought Shogun had a fucking awesome look. See, Shogun's weird because to me, he... I, he kind of looked like a FIFA original, but he very clearly is not. That's what's so beautiful. The series, man, he just like, it clicks. I would have never, I would have never imagined that he would have like just nailed this shit so fucking hard. But like, man, it just really sang. Like, anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself. But yeah, I, I barely knew, I barely knew Bloodstrike. Like, as I was reading about it, I was just like, oh, yeah, like the dude with the little skull right at the top of his bangs. 
like for some reason I remember that. Remember when all comic characters there were so many comic characters running around with tiny skulls. Yeah, I think uh, Adam Warlock uh, popularized it. Jim, Star- that was Jim Starlin's redesign, I think. And Tag, uh, the female that's more prominently featured. Yeah, uh, I didn't know anything about her until that second issue of this, and now I- that I know about her, she is really fucked up. I I remember her visual, but I did not know her name or power. Like that's the kind of connection to Bloodstrike that I had. So. Yeah, man, very, it, but I gotta tell you something, I'm fucking down to, like, get some old blood strike now, like, I wanna go back issue, like, it can't be hard to get. Well, like, I, 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 oh, I didn't even go into that story, I was at a Comic Con today, I went to, yeah, baby, I went to Terrificon in, uh, in Connecticut at Mohegan Sun Casino, it was right mm-hmm. in my backyard, I, uh, because it was right in my backyard, I decided to just make a day of it, cool, and, uh. Yeah, I saw Bloodstrike comics. Was not inclined to buy them, <laughs> uh, but they were there in the in the in the dollar bins in the fifty cent bins. I'm telling you, I'm I'm, I'm thinking it's it's influenced me, dude. I'm gonna go be picking some back issues up. So right off, I will say what my what before I started reading the series, I did do a, a modicum of research. Mm-hmm. So here's the funny thing about what this series is actually about. Uh, oh, it's I mean, great. I, I mean, the situation that it's trying to. Resolve, I guess. Mm-hmm. Bloodstrike only ran 22 issues. Right. Okay. And then, for whatever reason, there was a kind of flash-forward event yep. where, like, all the Liefeld books, like, jumped ahead to some future issue date. Mm-hmm. And they wrote the issues for that future date with the intent to fill back in the stuff prior to it. So, Bloodstrike was at 22. They jump straight to 25, mm-hmm. and then they never, ever bothered to make 23 and 24. <laughs> Which and is fucking hilarious and insane, if you think about it. And all subsequent sequels, uh, volumes, to Bloodstrike in the future took place after that 25th issue. So this yeah. apparently drove Michel Fife mad. <laughs> so... His pet project is to fill in those two missing issues, and that's what this series is. With an additional prequel comic. Yeah, so I, I think that was essential to make sure that we, as readers, understood what the fuck we were looking at. Dude, it's genius. Yeah. I just want to say, like, structure-wise, it's fucking genius, because issue zero, what you effectively have created here, if you've... okay. So I might as well I might as well have never read any Bloodstrike at all for all I actually remembered. Right. So what these three issues create, even though canonically they they make uh, a, a prequel issue zero, and, it and, takes then, place, and, they, and the zero issue takes place before events of issue one. It is a actual issue zero. It's not like a recap. Yeah. It takes place in the future. It's it's supposed to take place entirely before issue number one. Yeah, it's an issue zero. It sets up the series and sets up the, the structure of the whole team and everything. Um, and issue zero is the part, issue one of Bloodstrike Brutalist. Then 23 and 24 are part two and three. But what's beautiful is about the way it works is if you've never read any Bloodstrike, what's hilarious is that like this one, two, and three still work very well as like a beginning middle and end to this team it's what's so fucking crazy like it's genius the way this came together dude i can't believe it I, it blows my mind fucking honest to goodness i mean i like i i hate to jump on the praise train so damn hard but jim uh we won't be getting into three dear listeners i haven't read it yet Jim hasn't read it yet, but we'll do that at a later date with Craig, probably, because Craig was also here, and also three hadn't come out when Craig talked about it last time. So we will have a fresh chance to talk about one, two, and three all together, like with Craig, too. But uh, it's just genius. It doesn't ruin or spoil anything to say that issue three of Brutalists puts an end cap on the team. Right. Like, it wraps things up. Because I know for a fact, issue 25, apparently the whole deal is that the team is dead, and there's one character uh, left. So good, dude. I'm, I'm not going to say anything, because I don't want to, like, spoil anything, but 
this is just fucking masterstroke execution. <laughs> like, it's so good. Uh, the way he handles it, like I said, for, if you think about the fucking crazy structure we just described, here's, Blood Strike has to be like, what, almost 25 years old? Yeah, sure. So here's a guy in 2018 going back 25 years, making a zero-issue prequel, 23 and 24 to fill in a gap that nobody asked for. Nobody asked for this. <laughs> and to fill in a gap, a continuity gap, to be like, oh, what did happen in those issues? And also still yet, functionally, to make it so that new readers could read issues one, read this as issues one, two, and three of a series and have no connection to anything. And it fucking worked. Like, that's insane, dude. Yeah, an, it's pretty nuts. If an editor came to you and was like, look, I'm going to need you to do this, you'd think he was fucking crazy. So, I don't know. That, for one, the structure is awesome. But, uh, Jim, i got to ask you, so as a guy who has zero exposure, see, I have limited exposure. So for me, even though I didn't really know these characters intimately, like as much as you would say, like uh, Youngblood shows up, and as soon as I start seeing yeah. Chapel and Bedrock and Shaft, like I actually read those characters new when they came out, so that hit me in the nostalgic feels big time to see them. But seeing the Bloodstrike team, like, I had minimal, but like, so I still kind of had like a soft, like, oh yeah, I remember this guy, a little bit of this guy. How did this hit you as a dude with no connection to these characters? Not great. <laughs> I mean, I basically understood who most of these characters were. I had no understanding of most of their motivations, except for they are a government super team and they are violent about it. Um, and I would say the, 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 when Youngblood shows up in issue zero, there's a fight sequence between like three different groups because it's got Youngblood. Oh no, it's, it's really just Youngblood and these group called the four. Yep. And, um, uh, basically it's the origin of how, uh, what's his face? The Wolverine looking guy, uh, yeah. Deadlock, I guess gets bumped to, to become one of the, uh. The Bloodstrike members, instead of being part of Youngblood. Right. So I was vaguely confused about some of the fight choreography, like who's fighting who. But mm -hmm. once I figured out that, yeah, um, Deadlock isn't a member of these guys, I mean, isn't 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 one of the bad guys, Right. it, it made more sense. I could see that being confusing. Yeah, because um, he, he's getting, I don't know, it was, it was a little just a little bit odd to me, uh, structurally, until I really thought it through and looked at it carefully it's a fucking, fucking crazy concept um they are essentially a suicide squad right so... that's, that's what i wanted to get to is is, is uh, uh uh blood strike is essentially life suicide squad yeah they they die and only only unlike suicide i don't know i haven't read suicide squad but i'm saying uh I don't. I doubt they from don't. this like killer. Yeah, I was gonna say killer croc, and then I doubt they get killed and murdered. The thing with oh Blood no no, Strike, they get killed and murdered. They don't come back. That was the whole point of Suicide Squad. Is that like a bunch of C and D list supervillains get together, and like a third of them die for real, oh, real, permanently. Oh yeah. Huh. Well, that's more than I expected. <laughs> uh, you know my feelings. I, I just didn't think they would you know, actually that's kill. That's why those it's one characters. of the greatest uh, series of the Bronze Age. Because it took risks and, and wasn't afraid to get you to like somebody just to kill them. Well, I applaud that. Um, this fucking series, like, what's great about these uh, the Bloodstrike characters, though, is that like they they come back, uh, they're resurrected by Project Born Again, and uh, it's just funny to like this old stuff. Like I remembered as I read the words Project Born Again. Like I remembered that, like for like just the name, that name's like well, isn't stick that what a... resurrected uh, uh, Super Patriot? I have to, I do believe, yeah. Well, that's what's funny is like early '90s image was so connected. It was. I read the original four issue uh, Super Patriot miniseries, and I was shocked with how tied to Youngblood it was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, dude. Him well, and him and Deadlock are basically the same guy. They're both World War II era heroes who are cybernetically enhanced. Yeah, yeah. 
it's it's fucking crazy. And it's just funny because like Did you deadlock. I meant um. I knew uh, what you meant. I meant um for the audience. I meant um. <sighs> the guy who's a robot. He's like a cyborg. I wish I could remember his name. He he had a big role in that Prophet series. From Honestly. I'm not gonna be too good keen on the names like I don't know like for whatever reason that just didn't like names didn't stick other than like tag like the names didn't super like hit me in the like memory banks but uh, Die Hard his name's Die Hard Die Hard right 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 the cyborg the guy who's like red white and blue yeah so yeah you're right fucking Die Hard and fucking uh, Super Patriot are again which. What's funny is, weren't they kind of, in the early uh, image days, weren't they kind of, like, ripping each other off, too? What was? Like, the image creators. Oh, like, sure. They... Well, yeah, they were they... All, I think in a lot of ways, they were all coming from the same place. Yeah. I mean, they were all, just... they're all fans of those, the old superheroes that, that they were playing around with at Marvel, so obviously they would make their own. I just, uh... I remember too, like like the uh, the guy that get tasked in issue zero to kill these aliens, like the little like weird like elf eared, like they're elf eared with like the like sort of brown dark skin and green eyes. And it's funny because I just re- I remember those dudes the visual of them, like oh they're from a thing. Yeah, I, I well they like, were like there's if you look on the cover like one of them was like a team member at one point like, yeah it's kind of funny like they were, you remember how like. Uh, I don't know, it's kind of like the Covenant and the Sword. Like, it's right. just, like, one of those things that, like, if you didn't have any connection at all to that, it might not have stuck out to you so much, but it just, like, as I saw it, I was like, oh, all right. Cool. Speaking of, they appear in the second issue. Yeah. Um, I don't want to leave the first issue without just saying it's so fucking awesome. And you might be, like, a Savage Dragon listeners. You might be like, why is this coming up, like, twice now? on the Savage Dragon Fincast. This it's 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 interesting just like, you know, Michelle did his uh backup in the Twisted Dragon Funnies. Yep. And you know, there's that connection, but like it's so funny just to be part of the Savage Dragon community. You just keep seeing the same names pop up and the same people. And like Craig praised the design of uh issue zero last time that we talked about this on the last Fincast, how uh, Michelle uh, had the issue look like an old image comic. Like, the, you flip open the cover, and it's got that giant image eye with, yeah. like, an image in it. And then you flip to the back, and it's got, like, the letters page, and it looks like an old image comic. The thing is that, like, Adam Pruitt did that. Like, he did the design work on this. And then you flip open the letters page, and there's a letter from, like, Gavin Higginbotham, who we know is, you know, the editor on Savage Dragon, a long time, like, Savage Dragon, like, super, like, wiki, like, master, like, just knowledge. And then there's Merch, has also written a letter. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, the connection, I think Savage Dragon fans would fucking love this. Like, if you haven't checked it out, and much like Savage Dragon, so many, um, we were talking about how, like, Savage Dragon has, like, a lot of backup comics, and that's not something you get a lot of in right. other comics. This, these Bloodstrike uh, issues, these three issues, have lots of contributing backup artists. Yep, they got we got uh, like a, I think every issue's got like a three page chapel story. Yeah. But more impressive is all these ads for fake comics. I know, man. <laughs> like, and it's I was kind of like, oh, I was like this Ed Piskor. Dutch solo comic. I was like, yes, give it to me. Like, I will, I will, I will read it. <laughs> like, I love it, dude. I love it. Uh, I can't praise this enough, man. I think that it's probably uh, good for any Savage Dragon fan to check out. But I think that, like, if you read early Ima- early 90s era Image, yep. I think this will connect to you even more. Like, I mean, I wasn't there. I, honestly, a lot of it was a turnoff at the time, mm-hmm. but I can dig it here. So cool. I can appreciate the effort and the <laughs> intent, if not the source. Uh, it's beautiful. I, I just think it's cool, and I think it's uh, really awesome 
for someone to like do that or like early nineties images just portrayed in such a negative light so often, but there was cool stuff going on a little bit. <laughs> and I just, I think it's cool. I think it's cool to see like this early, uh, image nineties. And of course, Michelle's art is fucking incredible. Like I know he shares his artistic influences all the time, but like, man, I just, I don't know anybody that's making fucking comics like him. Like it's fucking crazy. Yeah, he's he, he has just he's got a combination of like two things. He's just great at like insane character action, uh huh. And his layouts are just absurd in like what he does with 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 lettering because he he does all his own lettering. Yeah. Yeah, hand lettered. That's he, fucking he just, crazy. He just knows how to make it a whole package. And on top of that, I would say a thing that too. There's like an extreme technical proficiency. Like in the second issue, you're flipping through, and you see uh, the tag is going to the uh, secret club, and on the cover is just the icon that is on the front of the club. Just that weird shape. And for the rest of the issue, the minute you see that, you know exactly where you are. Right. Like, there's that weird icon, and it keeps coming up, and it keeps showing up. And I'm just saying, like, just so... Like, that's expert graphic, like, storytelling, dude. Like, that's just, like, composition laying out a page, visual callbacks. Like, that's just fucking expert comic making. So, yeah, it's, it's good. Getting in the second issue, you said it was uh, super fucked up. You want to elaborate on that? <laughs> well, before I get to the super fucked up part, um, you were talking about the inside front cover yeah. stuff. Um, so I just found this interesting. The the Zero issue has like the early, early image inside front cover design. Yes. The, whereas this issue would, of course, have come out later. So it has the later inside image side with the big red, the tall... Yeah image i yes dude yes that's what i'm saying is like the attention to detail like that that's it and also too it's just funny because if you look go back to issue zero and you look like the extreme studios it's mentioned but it's downplayed right right? now of course oh yeah 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 when you go to the second part issue 23 extreme issues is all giant and it's not downplayed it's just, I'm saying, like, just that level of detail. And again, Adam Pruitt jumping in there and doing that stuff. Uh, ah, it's just so cool, man. It's so fucking awesome. So, yeah, fucked up to toot. <laughs> so, this story is just, it's one, it's just, the character tag, which is that blonde chick with the, with the diamonds cover in her eyes, which is, she's got a pretty good design, to be honest. Yeah. At least comparatively to some of these others. Shogun's cool. Shogun's and, and, fucking and, great. And I'm not super hot on uh, uh, the forearm girl as much, but I like her a bit. But the main character what the is just like the cable knockoff. I don't really care for him. Yeah, I think he's uh, cool in that he has that image 90s, like uh, unmistakably. Very much so. So he's cool in that way, but yeah, compared to like Shogun or Tag or the forearm guy, I was I, I like you was super surprised by how cool Tag still looks. Yeah, and I guess her power is to paralyze people. It's like Tag, you're it. Yeah, right. she just touches them and they're stopped. Which is fucking. I I again I didn't have the connection to the characters enough to know her superpower, and I was like, that's a fucking great superpower, actually. So yeah, the, the the general gist of the story in this issue is that she has unprotected sex, passes whatever genetic thing they did to them to make them regenerate and immortal. So this guy basically starts falling apart because he's not getting the injections the government gives to their agents to keep them from falling apart. So he is is basically going crazy because he's dying from this condition that mm-hmm. she put on him. Yeah. <laughs> and she doesn't care. She just wants sex. She goes out and has sex all the time. It just so happens that this guy's rich, so he can do something about it. <laughs> On top of all that, she does show some compassion because the, the, the weirdo sex club she likes to visit 
has a bunch of waitresses she used to know go missing. So she kind of stumbles into what happened to them, which turns out they all got kidnapped into a sex dungeon and had all mm. their eyes and features removed. Yeah. <laughs> which is batted. And then <laughs> later, she doesn't so much rescue them as turn them over to the government, who then chop them up for extra body parts because because uh, because uh, Bloodstrike needs extra body parts all the time. <laughs> yeah, we needed the parts. <laughs> the fuck is this? <laughs> Superheroes, am I right? It was so great, though, because what was hilarious is that, like, that really is indicative of the kind of group, like, the kind of scummy government organization. I don't know if anybody, like, probably, this is all I remember. I remembered enough to know, and it's funny, they kind of talk about it here in this, uh, in these issues, but, like, the way that Youngblood was portrayed in the early image days is they were celebrity superheroes. Right. Like whenever people would fight him, they'd be like, Oh, you're a pretty boy. Oh, you know, I'm going to mess up your face. You won't look so good on TV anymore. Shaft, you know, stuff like that. And then like the blood strike team, they were like, not celebrities. They were like covert, like just trash, just government garbage. Like, and it's kind of funny because like, no, these aren't really like noble heroic organizations. <laughs> like, they're just like, hey, you know, yeah, you found these people. We needed the parts. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's fucking a lot. It's a awesome, dude. Little touches of the detail. Like if you look at like Chapel's face in that panel, you notice he's less like makeup and he's more like skeletal looking. Yeah. That's because fucking Spawn grabbed his face and like turned his face from paint into like an actual like bone. I was <laughs> just saying, like, there's little things like that. I don't know why it came back to me so easy. But as I was reading it, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Continuity that no one would care about. And yet, it's there, dude. Wait, where does Chapel show up? Just, he's on a panel uh, whenever she's standing there, when he's talking about dumping the bodies. Oh, okay. So after the double page spread where you see the, you know, people missing parts flip over there and you just see Chapel's like face drawn in pencil on a, like a computer oh, monitor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's it's not his fa- lower jaw. Yeah. Spawn. <laughs> Chapel and Spawn, dude. Oh, yeah. And so apparently there's a cop also trying to track down these missing women. And mm-hmm. he runs into the guy who's been falling apart because he had unprotected sex. And they basically murder each other. Real bad. No, they don't. They don't murder each other. Although they're about to. This co- the Covenant of the Sword guy takes him out as mm-hmm. witnesses. At which point, Tag then murders murders him real bad. Yeah, at least that's how I read it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happens. And what's funny is if you read the letters page, that, that wasn't just some random characters that he made up. That was actually like Michelle was wrapping up like like they introduced those characters, like the boyfriend and the cop. And oh. then never never did anything with them. Oh. And so that's... He's, like, actually wrapping up their arc, like, with this issue. Like, he's telling people what happened to those characters. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Dude, I'm telling you, like, it's so funny. Like, readers, if you read these, do make sure to go back and read, like, Michelle's letter columns and stuff. Because they shed, li- he sheds light and insight with each issue. If you didn't know what was going on, and it could be, I could see where it could be a little confusing. But if you didn't know what's going on, you will know what's going on by the time you read. Like it was just to me, because I didn't know, I had no idea the continuity, and I read it and I was like, oh man, that is such a hilarious and fucked up story. Like kind of tales from the crypt desk. Right. And then I go back and I read the letters column. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, that wraps up this guy and that wraps up this guy. Like, they met each other and killed each other outside of this. I was like, oh, man, it's fucking great. Interesting. So, so yeah, the backups, uh, we get the we get the first comic appearance of the pouch. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> At night, I rest. Oh, that's uh, hilarious, you know, dude. It's good that Liefeld can take a joke so well. <laughs> I'm telling you, dude, that's that's fantastic. And I like that apparently 
like what's funny is in the uh, art that he put on the internet, the pouch was like you know using guns and whatnot. Right. But uh, doesn't it kind of appear here that the pouch is just putting people in pouches. It does appear to just kind of be consuming people, <laughs> yeah. which is honestly worse. Yeah. <laughs> At night I rest. <laughs> so funny we get some more that, chapel and we get some more fake ads yeah ah good stuff dude it's kind of like a brandon graham influence looking on this uh chapel story yeah it is a bit different than the first one isn't it yeah and i do love too like if you notice like in the letter section the morgue like actually there's an honest to god envelope art yep like remember you know every magazine ah it's so funny to think I, I doubt there's anybody listening to this podcast that doesn't remember this kind of stuff. But like, Once remember, upon a time, you had to send actual letters to people <laughs> in the mail with paper. And it was really common for people, I don't know why, but it was really common for people to deck their letter out, the envelope, to like just draw all over the fucking envelope like a picture. Huh. It's kind of awesome that there's an honest-to-God, like, Somebody mailed in an envelope letter. So good, dude. I, I can't praise this enough. It's good, and we won't really get into three, I guess. Yeah, um, I haven't I, read it yet. I will just vaguely say again, uh, just to uh, keep it keep it vague, is that what's nice is that it, it's a great little end cap, and uh, it does a good job of. Like, it's kind of funny because if you think about it, like, what ends up happening, these are, like, Bloodstrike was a teen book, and yet Issue Zero really focuses on uh, the Wolverine-type fella. Issue Two focuses on Tag, and then Issue Three focuses on one more person I won't mention. Again, keeping it vague. But uh, it's kind of funny that even though you're only really seeing like basically one character per issue focused on heavily you still get the fate and the characters and personality of the whole team and it's kind of cool how like he pulls it off and uh when you read three jim uh do read the backup because it makes the issue the issue is cool enough but read the backup so that you see like the context of it it's even cooler, so, yeah. And it continues the trend of, like, time-sensitive graphic design and, you know, great backups and just... It's good, dude. It's so good. 10 out of 10. I fucking loved this. I could fucking read this kind of shit all day long. It was fantastic. And I think Savage Dragon fans will super-duper love it. So, 10 out of 10. Loved it. Every issue was great. Fantastic. Yep, pretty good. Glad I read it. You want to, uh, you want before we get to the meat and potatoes, what was the, dear listener, we just didn't have any news. This is, these uh, Larson issues have been just coming out way too fast. Too fast for news. <laughs> too fast for news, too fast for letters. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to help you out by giving you a little more to listen to. Uh, before we get to the meat and potatoes, Jim, do you want to talk turtles? Um... Do you want to do it now or after? Oh, it's up to you, man. You're the maestro. You make the call. How about this? Why don't we talk about Turtles after we do the dragon issue? Okay. Like we did last time. Oh, we'll keep it consistent, right? Right. But I'm going to talk real quick about the Comic-Con I went to today. Yeah, dude. Because I forgot to do that. Lay it on us. Lay so it, on us. It was, it's called Terrificon, and it's uh, it takes place at Mohegan Sun Casino in uh, southeastern Connecticut. Right. I believe it's like the second or third year they've done it, mm-hmm. but this is the first year that it was host he- held in the new Expo Center they built, right? Which is basically a huge warehouse designed to be a expo for exhibitions, I guess. Okay, it, it places the thing's fucking massive, mm-hmm. um, and this con is I would call I'd say it's a medium. It's pretty much a medium sized con. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't been to enough of them, but it was it was smaller than Boston, which I'd have been to. Okay. Um, and it was definitely bigger than the the Comic Con that Foxwoods, the other casino in the area, had a month ago. But Fox okay. was, Foxwoods kind of sucks, and I think that con is more of an afterthought for a lot of people. Although I did meet, 
I did end up meeting um, the guy who did Johnny Raygun at the, okay. at the, at the, at the Rich Woodall. Yeah, I met. I briefly talked to him at the Foxwoods Con a month ago. Cool. Um, he was he was cool to meet. I'm glad. Um, my, although my my opinion of that con might be colored by the fact that I only got to go the last two hours on the last Sunday. Oh yeah, and dude. I and I still had to pay thirty three dollars to get in the door. Oh yeah, listen, Sunday is not a day to measure any convention by. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's as the con dies. That, that'd yeah. be like meeting someone in their like eighties yeah. and be like, I don't see what the big deal was about Muhammad Ali being an athlete. That right. looked like a piece of shit. So alternatively, Terrificon, the one I went to today, I went on Saturday, early in the morning, or well, when they opened at ten, and only paid thirty dollars to get in the door. Nice. Um, I want to say this. I, this is what I would call a comic book convention. It was very much comic book geared. There was a. There was a, uh, a, a actor's area, mm-hmm. but it was very separated from all the comic stuff. The, mm-hmm. comic, cre- the comic creators were all localized together. Nice. Then, the, then the, like the, like the art people, who are just art, they aren't really comics, mm-hmm. they were in their own section. Nice. And then all the vendors were in their own section. So it wasn't, it was very well organized in terms of layout. What you have described is exactly what Heroes does. And for me, Heroes is the gold standard, so that's fantastic. Right. Terrific con. If you're aping Heroes, fantastic. Yeah, I liked it. It just it just meant I got to easily avoid the Funko Pops. <laughs> that's always a plus. And Creepy I was black eyes. And I, I wasn't into too many any of the uh, the uh, actors who were there. I mean, Henry Winkler was there. Oh, geez, the Fonz. Yeah, the Fonz himself. <laughs> you're but, not uh, into Arthur Fonzarelli. Hey. The actor from that one episode of BoJack Horseman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're many episodes of Arrested Development. Come on. I, Come haven't, on. I haven't seen all of Arrested Development. You know their lawyer. Oh. The shitty lawyer. The, Saul? Oh, wait. That's a wrong one. <laughs> I would love if Saul was lawyer for the Bluths. The Bluth family. So, I didn't get to... Uh, I, I, I primarily went... Because when I looked at the guest list for the comic creators, mm-hmm. a few big names really stood out to me. Uh, Roy, okay. Roy Thomas was there. Okay. I don't know if you know who that is. I don't. Put it in context. Right. Roy, Roy Thomas was the editor of Marvel Comics after Stan Lee. Ooh, okay. Yeah, so he, he, he defined a lot of the early Bronze Age, late Silver Age period at Marvel. Uh, he would then go on to DC Comics, where okay. he would basically get be given Earth 2. As his playground, okay, where he did all of these Golden Age superhero stories, All Star Squadron, Infinity Inc., mm-hmm. and basically he was a huge name during that Bronze Age period of DC. A writer or an editor? Writer. Okay, okay. okay. He was editor at Marvel. He did some writing. Uh, I believe he wrote. Uh, he did some writing at Marvel too. I think he did like early like uh, uh, Captain Marvel, uh, Marvel Mar- Marvel Comics, Captain Marvel. Okay. I, I, that's kind of why he was there, because him, Jim Starlin was there. Mm-hmm. Um, Roger Stern, I want to say. Okay. These guys, they were all like that early because of the because of the Infinity War movie. They got basically all the cosmic architects to this con for this panel I went to. Okay. All about that. Were they just like that movie sucks? Actually, they loved it. Oh, they loved it for okay. the most part. <laughs> I mean, they had because they under, as creators they understand that you can't tell the same story as the comic because the number one reason is half the characters that were in the comics haven't been introduced yet. Yeah, so that, that's a problem right there. But uh, yeah, they thought uh, Jim Starlin in particular was not so much involved in the creation of the Thanos character for the movie, but he was mm-hmm. consulted, so okay. he he got to see all that pretty early. Um, pretty cool guys. But, uh, yeah, but the other ones were, like, uh, Jerry Ordway was there. Oh, yeah, right, who, cool. Who, of course, has a bit of a dragon connection through Wildstar. Okay, yeah. And, and I got my, and I got him and Al Gordon created Wildstar, and Wildstar, nice. of course, has his place in dragon history. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got my Wildstar number one signed. Cool. For $2, because Jerry Ordway charges for, for signatures. Hey, look, man, man's got to eat, okay? Well, it was for beer money, according to the sign. Well, hey, man's got to get tanked, okay? Yes. <laughs> Liquid bread. Yeah, he it counts. Jerry Ordway is a very busy man. He's uh, he, he he had a line all day. Mm-hmm. 
I think the two dollar thing is just to stop people from bringing them stacks of books to sign. Yeah, dude, that's all. And also, I'm sorry, but two dollars is the cost of a bottle of soda, basically. Sure. If you can't fucking chuck a bottle of soda's worth of effort towards like getting uh, like a legend to sign something of yours, I mean, get fucked. Yeah. And he's pretty cool. I talked to him about Wildstar briefly. Mm-hmm. Um, Did he say you 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 remember? Wild stuff. Well, like, I don't know. I, his reaction to me handing him the book wasn't as impressive as I thought it would be. I think <laughs> I, I don't think it's as uncommon as you'd think. Okay. <laughs> okay. But I mentioned he he did some art on the on a on a recent comic I really like called uh, Semi Auto Magic. Okay. It was like it's this really fun um, supernatural adventure comic. Mm-hmm. It ran in Dark Horse Presents. I liked it a lot. He did the art on that. Okay. They want to do more, but it's but when Star Wars left Dark Horse, the editorial realities changed, so that series kind of got lost in the shuffle when mm. they when, when they when they when they kind of had to change their business operations. God damn Star Wars! Yeah, I know, right? Huge, huge foot for it. Ugh. But um, other than that, I did meet. I'm gonna leave a pause here while I remember how to say his name. Chris G. What's his, how's his last name? Giaruso, I think. G- Giaruso? I want. I always say Giaruso. Giaruso? Could be Giaruso, though. You poisoned my mind. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I met I met uh, G-Man creator Chris G. Awesome. Uh, briefly. I got him to sign my uh, old, uh, the, the first, I think the first G-Man trade paperback. Nice. Which I think reprinted a lot of the dragon material. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got him to sign that. He, that was nice. He, he was he, now he was surprised to see it, that particular oh, really? book. Really? Just, I, I, he didn't have any copies to sell. I assume it's been sold out for a while. <laughs> I haven't seen this in a long time. Flip yeah. through. <laughs> I mean, he's got he's got other books out right now. He's got a brand new series coming out. Um, I forget the name of it off the top of my head. It's not too hard Green, to find. Green Pokey Dotty Alien. Yeah, that one. you know you know i try not to bother these guys too much so i just uh, got my book signed said hi and introduced introduced myself as uh, jim from the savage fan cast which he says he listens to okay <gasps> cool. shock or shock our tiny fandom <laughs> listens to our podcast that's cool dude um chris i love your work <laughs> yeah it's definitely a highlight Basically, he told a story about how his most recent few... Uh, oh, wait, no, it's a different story. Different guy. Sorry. We're going to get to this. <laughs> the, no, wait, there was another guy. Yeah, well, the other guy I talked to was the mm-hmm. other backup guy. Okay. Let me grab his name off the lip that last issue real quick, just to be polite. Okay. Um, that doesn't help me. <laughs> Jacob Chabot, who does uh, the Mighty Skull Boy. Awesome. Yes, he was basically right next to Chris G. Cool. Um, him being on the, uh, the itinerary was another reason I decided to take today off to go. Nice. To this con just to meet him. Um, apparently, apparently, uh, what he told me was that Eric was looking to fill some pages in the back of this issue. Didn't uh-huh. have a backup, so he put out the call to contributors. Um. Jacob had a, I want to say a Christmas themed backup uh, a story mm-hmm. that was black and white. Okay. And Eric was going to run that, I believe. This is uh, this is coming from memory. Okay, Christmas themed. <laughs> yeah, All right. but he was iffy on it, and so then he, then uh, Jacob realized he also had this story, which was also colored, where the, as the Christmas story was not yet colored. Okay. So Eric just said, "Yeah, it's colored. I'll run that instead." And that's how this got in this issue. <laughs> I like I like sometimes the behind the scenes. It's not any more spectacular than, eh, give me that. <laughs> well, that's cool, man. That's like two serious, heavy hitting, long time contributors. Yeah, well, that's three, awesome. Three to count Orway. Oh yeah, well shit, yeah, geez, what am I thinking? Three, yeah, dude, that's awesome. Man, what a good con! Only thirty bucks. Yeah, actually, yeah, it was real cheap. 
shit, yeah, Jim, that's fantastic. Dude. And I also got to dig through dollar bins like I like to do to find all the all the all the random trash that that is not likely to find its way to uh, to digital anytime soon. The the-, oh. the theme of this con appeared to have been mostly cross gen and E man. Okay. I found a bunch E-Man. of E man by uh, Joe Staten. Unbelievable. Yeah. I did not know that he was actually a thing. Uh, Joe, Joe, oh, e, you, what, E Man? No, I'm joking. I only know him. I'm, I'm, I'm making a joke of my own ignorance. Uh, I, I only know E Man. Seriously, I'm not even kidding. From the wedding. From the, from the background of Savage Dragon. Ah, yes, he, he does show up in the wedding uh, of yeah. Barbaric and Ricochet, I believe. Literally, the only exposure I have. Oh yeah, uh, E Man's been around since the late '70s. Are you shitting me? Oh yeah, he's basically one of the proto type. OG indie characters. What? He was published at Charlton originally, and then Charlton went under, and then he got self-published for a while, and then when First Comics was a thing, he got published there. That's pure insanity. I had no idea. Yeah, Joe, Joe Staten is like a longtime DC artist. Did a lot of uh, Legion of Superheroes, Superman, that sort of thing. I'm a dumbass, dude. I don't know anything. My God, that's crazy as shit. So I just got a bunch of the the, the first comics, like, late 80s material, because it, it was just... I found two different dollar bins with different stuff. It isn't a complete run, but it is a good chunk of it. <laughs> All right. It was, it was good luck. Good, yeah, dude, dollar bin I, The best $19 I've spent in a while. So, like, delightful. 50 cent comics? Oh, yeah. Oh, so good. Especially when they're books you're looking for. Crazy, crazy story. Crazy, just quick, crazy story. Yeah, man, that's what we're here for. Lay it on us. There is a book. Oh, actually, it ties Carter into Image Comics. Um, okay. One of the Image founders. Um, what the fuck's his name? The one who what the, the guy who did the guy who did Wet Works. Walsh Portasio. He, he, I believe. Yeah. I found the first issue of a two-part maxi series, uh, a prestige format. Squarebound series from Marvel, okay. written by Steve Gerber and drawn by him, okay. Called Legion of the Night, number one, at the local at my local Goodwill, a month ago, okay, for a dollar. I picked it up because I love Steve Gerber, mm-hmm. and I found it interesting that this image founder. This is I've never really seen any of this guy's art before, and okay. this is like a supernatural thing. But whatever. So I get this issue in number one. I discover, oh, this is a two. There's two parts to this. How am I ever going to find the second part in a fucking dollar bin at this con today? The only <laughs> co- the only copy, and only part two. <laughs> exactly what you needed. Exactly right? what I needed. <laughs> but then it gets even funnier uh-huh. because in the same bin is the number one issue of a mm-hmm. series called uh, Gizmo and the Fugiroid, which was a Mirage comic series that came out. Way back when they were doing the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comics. Okay, yeah, Fugitoid. Fugitoid, right. Uh, this was a crossover between an even older character called Gizmo. Okay. I found issue number two of that at a, like, three months ago at a, at a, at a, at a, not a uh, kind of a, a swap meet. Mm-hmm. And I find issue one of that in a bin today. Okay. Completing my two issue run of that. Telling you, man, there is there are few things as exciting and fun as just like that's how I made my Savage Dragon collection. Right. It's just I didn't order online much. I did for like maybe a thing or two, but for the bulk of it, I just went to random different comic shops in three different states and just pieced it together. And just pieced it. Together. That's why my knowledge is so weird and spotty and out of like disconnected. Right. Like you know because I didn't read that shit in order, and still yet to this day have not. I need to fix that, but still yet have not done a sequential read through. Oh. And no. My my, my sequential re- read through is weird because I go. Um, issue one through like issue like, well, I want to say like forty, mm-hmm. jump to ninety, go to mm-hmm. current, go back and fill in that middle piece I missed. Yeah, but it, it's so magical to just like like looking through back issue bins and just finding that thing you're looking for. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 and it, it just they're just they're obscure, 
Uh-huh. They're not even. It's not even like Savage Dragon. I found Savage Dragon issues all day, but oh, yeah. I, I don't need them. I got them. Yeah. He said, I don't need him, I got him. Let me ask you, I know you're all digital. You still got your physical dragon copies, though, right? I mean, I stopped buying my physical dragon copies about 2012. Your old ones, I mean. Yes, I held on to those. Even okay, though okay. I could replace them, I, I, I did decide to keep those. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Just I, I, I did have a couple of comic box purges over the last few years, and the dragon comics continue to persist. Like yeah, I got rid the of first twelve issues of Invincible, and uh, oh, I'm waiting for that movie to drop before I flip that one. I got burned on my Walking Dead collection because I I sold it a year too early. Oh no, dude! I made I, I sold issue number. I think I made like seven hundred dollars for like the first twenty five issues. Ooh. I could have made like twelve or thirteen a year later. Oh, you know what's funny? Oh no, you is... know what? It was you no, know, it was different. Than that. I made like three hundred dollars. If you had more patience, I feel like Walking Dead number one yeah. is some shit that is going to just go up and up and up and up. Sure. Yeah. Oh, I, that, I feel... that, that, that's gone now. Yeah. My retirement is, is gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. And you but know I'm... what? That Don't forget that issue number two is actually harder to find. Uh, that, Walking Dead? For, for, yeah, first print of issue number one, uh, number two is actually a lower print run than number one. Issue two of everything is actually harder to find. Almost always, yes. Yeah, because uh, they they order heavy on one, and then they always uh, shitty it up on two because they're just like, man, nah, they don't know. And they really backed off on Walking Dead number two. Apparently, the sales on two and three were so bad the series almost got canceled. Can you imagine? I mean, seriously, like <laughs> one of the one of the greatest successes in North American comics, <laughs> just like shit can like. I don't know. There's just something to be said about the slow burn. That's all I'm saying. Word of mouth was important on that series early yeah. on. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny to think that when that came out, like zombies were not really a thing, like they are now. You know, like fucking zombies are everywhere. But yeah. Oh my god, dude! Your con experience sounds fantastic. Oh, it was That's... a good day. I saw some panels, and I paid too much at Johnny Rockets. <laughs> you know, I did the whole thing. Well, that's great, dude. I'm glad. Like, you met some legends. That's awesome. Fuck yeah, dude. That's anytime. Here's the thing. Anytime you can meet people at a convention, uh, just even if you meet one or two cool like artists, that's a success. Because a lot of the times at conventions, you don't have like a big bunch. It sounds like you met like three or four people that you really like super dug. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. Very cool. Very I cool. I definitely want to go you? again next year. Shit, yeah, dude. Fantastic. Because this appears to be a con that's going places. Good. It's got a good, good venue, and it's got good turnout, you know, people-wise, and it's got a good collect, good set of guests. So it's everything I want. When you when you said that it was organized in the exact same fashion as Heroes, that told me everything I needed to know right there. It's like the cons that put the celebrities as their top headliners, that's not, you don't want to waste your time. I mean, they were like a good, the, this big, the, the, the actual big expo hall, mm-hmm. like the front, like fourth of it was all dedicated to, to, to actors. Ugh, but it was I like, like but it was like a horseshoe so that like the lines mm-hmm. could fit. So it was, mm-hmm. it was very open. Okay. Ba- basically what I'm saying is you could probably fit about 50% more, more stuff in there and not feel crowded. Oh, all right. well, so it's, okay. it's got room to grow, is what I'm saying. Good. To be a premier Comic Con. To get ruined, you're saying. Yes, basically. exactly. <laughs> because the funny is, no con ever grows and gets better. They just grow until they're off. <laughs> and, and, and then you long for that medium-sized convention that got you hooked originally. Yeah. Oh, if only this well, the was one, small... The one thing I wish it did have was all, all of the panels were like big hour-long... There, there was like there's like there was like only one uh like one room mm-hmm. so there was only like six or seven panels that were like an hour long each all day so there weren't Oof. any like little like side panels like going right. over like how to create a comic or or like various esoteric topics it was just panel of creators panel of creators panel of creators i, I guess i wish there were just a few more like uh, esoteric uh panels 
You said you did some panels. Like, uh, did any of those noteworthy? Any of those you want to bring up? Like, some cool I mean, person you heard speak? I mean, Roy Thomas and Jim Starlin went over okay. the whole early Marvel Cosmic stuff. and uh, So that was a panel. They did that. And then uh, Jerry Ordway and a bunch of other guys did a 80 Years of Superman panel, which was fun. Just talking about Superman. Cool. Superman's cool. Yeah, yeah. He's cool when he had a mullet. I mean, man. Superman's always cool. Don't let the haters fool you. But yeah, we should probably get into the real reason we're here. Oh, it's meat and potatoes, baby. It doesn't matter when you have them. They're always delicious. <laughs> Savage Dragon 237. Finally, the Scourge. Can I just say, these are the meatiest potatoes. This is a great issue. <laughs> a, a, a lot of stuff going on. Good. Very good. I loved this one so much, dude. Scourge, he was everything I wanted. Looking at this cover now, don't you want to laugh remembering the cover debacle? The 80 different color variants? <laughs> yeah. And then like 100 million little Twitter peanut opinions, like peanut gallery opinions. Oh, you should make uh, the word Scourge uh, yellow. Oh, what if you made the word Blair red? Like, it really does work. Just fine. I just had to, I couldn't not bring that up. It really does just work just to be black. Yeah, yeah. Keeps the focus on Scourge himself. Yep, he pops. As it should be. Purple on purple, so awesome. Scourge is such a cool visual. And even when you flip it open, beware the Scourge. He's put, like, like, Nikos has put, like, beware the Scourge. The banner is purple. Like, I'm just saying, so good. (laughs) So you're saying we associate the color purple with this guy. Yeah, dude. (laughs) Like... I'm just saying, already getting iconic, and he's just on the cover. How about that that gold sticker ribbon, <laughs> that gold ribbon that says kick, kick ass, ass. <laughs> yeah. with the credit stuff? I love that. I love it. <laughs> it's a classic. Farron Delgado, uh, truly just the man has been a gift. Like, the man has been a gift that keeps on giving. And yeah, that kick ass I'm so glad you mentioned it, because, like, if you weren't gonna, I was gonna. Like, oh, so good, dude. How about, uh, you know, this sounds so hilarious to mention, but, like, I just forgot that Skullface is black. Really? They're not Skullface, but fucking Kevin. I forgot Thunderhead is black. Well, like, that makes sense. His mom was, uh, Rapture. Yeah, but when I'm I saw... I'm not sure Drew... what... I'm not sure... Oh, you know what? Skullface would be black, too, because... I mean, I guess, I guess I assume that because he was friends with Frank. Mm-hmm. I guess that's just an assumption I'm making. No, Skullface had really long red hair. Oh, that's right. He did have red hair. Yeah, really I'd long I'd have to go back hair. and read that. It's been a while. I mean, obviously there's things you can do. Like, you know, you can you know, straighten it out and dye it and all that shit. But I'm just saying, like, he kind of looked like he had white guy hair. Like, you right. know what I mean? Yeah, I get you. I don't know. But uh, seeing Julia, little human Julia there, uh, I just forgot. And it's cool. I only bring it up just because I think it's funny how, how like Savage. How he introduces them as her as their aunt and not their <laughs> cousin. Well, she is their aunt, though. Yeah, she's their aunt and their cousin. Oh, yeah. Because they're their brother's daughter and then their, their mother's mother's daughter. Wait. Wait. Yeah, I was going to say, what? wait a minute. It's getting too convoluted. I, I can't keep up. There's definitely two things. She'd be their, their gr- aunt, their... though. Right, because Kevin's their uncle, so she's their right. aunt. But Kevin is... Wait. No, Kevin, that's just it. That's the end. Kevin's their, Kevin's their brother. Yeah, but Maya's Maxine's mother. Yeah, so Maxine is the kid's mom. So that's her sister. That still makes for that's the kids. Her, okay, so it's her sister the, and her aunt. Okay. Yeah, he, he's introducing he's introducing Julia to the kids. He says, "This is your aunt." That that's for them. That's where the relationship ends. Okay. Like that's just their aunt. Okay, I, I just would think they would be their cousins, because because Kevin's their well, their uncle. Like only through marriage, though. What Kevin? Kevin? No, he's genetically related to Malcolm. Oh, wait. Shit. Okay. 
Yeah. Oh, never mind. What a great conversation. <laughs> not, not important. Not important. Never mind. <laughs> okay, so that's weeds, word dude. balloon number one. Let's get through the next. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm like, I know listeners are going crazy. Like, I'm just saying, like, I'm just like, whoa, what the hell? It's just funny. I just wanted to praise, like, I just think it's cool how, like, Savage Dragon has, like, multicultural and biracial characters, like, so effortlessly. Yeah. Like, I just, I completely forgot. There's but, one like, white person on this page. Well, I guess you, maybe Jack. Jack's white. Jack. Yeah, well, kind of. He's Krillian. <laughs> Krillian and white. <laughs> but no, nah, man, it's cool. Uh, I love it. And this double page spread of the faces. <laughs> I instantly knew what the gag was. And the minute I saw the faces, I knew what the gag was. <laughs> you still there? I am still here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just letting you have your moment. Oh, that was, that was See, this this is the Malcolm sitting at a desk for like six pages and not moving that I dig. <laughs> it's good, dude. It, it's really hard to make uh, so many panels of just faces visually interesting. And yet, uh, especially on Angel, like Angel's expressions are ultra hilarious. The one on the bottom row in the center on the seam of the comic, everybody's a winner, everybody's happy. <laughs> the little lit bite. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, sorry, it's funny. Content-wise, uh, they're having the often discussed these days, Maxine has problems conversation. Yes. Yeah, so it's funny, you know, I was just saying, like you guys were saying, you're feeling like it's growing old. I feel like... I don't know. I feel like it's building towards some kind of solution. Possibly. Well, that's what we're saying is that we, we want, we, we want it to build towards that solution. I mean, it doesn't Me? need to go, it doesn't need to go away. It just kind of needs to stop stopping the book. <laughs> I don't think it stops it. I think it's just the comedy. I think it's the comedy bit these days. I mean, it's not bad as like a framing device for this, like back and forth conversation. It's pretty good. Look at Maxine's hair growing in fast, bro. Well, they, uh, you know, Kevin and I had the baby, so it's been about a month, probably. Oh, shit, you're right. Dude, talking about Fern Delgado's littering again, the the splash, like the, that panel, like that one. That's awesome, dude. Oh, that's hilarious. I, I just think it's funny. I don't know. Just for me, I know it's not for everyone. I apologize if you hate it. Or if you feel it slows the book down. But for me, this shit cracks me up. I think, like, sex as comedy is always funny. Like, it's hilarious. And so for me, this is just fucking... Even though, like... And even, like, the characters. Like, even Malcolm is like, Yeah, I just thought we were done with this. Like... <laughs> I don't know. They're, they're recognizing the absurdity of their situation. That's important to me. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're recognizing that it's absurd. Then we got uh, Gene Tech Laboratories. Yes. Dude, can I just say, right here, this page effortlessly ties up what that junkyard dog creature was. Did it? Yeah, man. Old Kettlecorn's been experimenting on animals and turning them nearly human. Okay, yep. Not only does that explain Buffalo Stew, but that's your junkyard dog monster. Right, right, right. Yeah, I knew it, I knew it dealt with Buffalo Stew. Yeah, because uh, they talk about him. Uh, yes, yes. I uh, enjoy these twos back and forth. They have kind of, I think the one guy, the guy in particular, just kind of has like a funny manner of speech. Like a crawfish old top, I'm afraid I have some bad news. Oh yeah, he's got that old timey yeah it's kind of interesting sort of like just a way for the guy to talk there what do you think i think this deserves its own little aside it's time to settle the kettle corn crawfish debacle is that a good name or not jim what's your take kettlefish crawford uh kettle corn crawfish kettle corn crawfish yeah it's a pretty wild name too much i agree 
<laughs> you agree? Do you think it's too much, or do you think it's all right? I think it's just fine. I think it's just fine, too, baby. I think his names go, like Walden Wang, Kettlecorn Crawfish. I like my uh, comic names to be punchy and memorable. Yep. I mean, I did, we just read Bloodstrike Brutalist, and like I couldn't remember like Wolverine guy's name. But I'll never forget Kettlecorn Crawfish. Like, you read it once, and you remembered it forever. Oh, just saying, that's a winner. That's, I, I praise the name. If I have a baby on accident, it's going to be a mistake. I'm going to say, Eric, I need you to name this bastard I just spawned. Something memorable. Break it off. Something memorable. <laughs> Something memorable. I need some alliteration, and also just a, a dash of preposterousness. It's I'm, good, though. I'm sure you would get it from him. <laughs> now they're firing uh, Kettle Corn. They, they had a vote, and he's off. The board voted him out of his own company. It's funny. Uh, Eric mentioned uh, building a rogues gallery up from scratch in his interview on comicbook.com with Russ Berlingame. Uh, he mentioned that he didn't just want... Uh, it's funny, like, when as soon as I saw uh, Scourge, I was like, oh, Canadian Overlord. He said he didn't want there to just be a Canadian Overlord, that he wanted to build up to it. Right. And so, yeah. I think it's kind of awesome. Like, this issue is Scourge's origin. Like, this is the moment in time in which he just decided to flip his shit. Yep. And I, I do appreciate that, because... We're going to get to it, but uh, this guy is pretty wild from out the gate. Yeah, dude. For one, although what's beautiful is even before you see the guy, here is a guy who introduced through two other characters talking, who not only is successful and smart enough to have founded his own genetics company, but on top of that is smart enough and depraved enough to do, like, humanoid animal experimentation. Like, already, just through two two characters talking about him, you're getting that this is an eccentric and interesting character, just from two other characters talking. Yeah. Right you, actually, you actually don't get a lot from him himself. No, that's what's cool. Like, he's getting this build-up from these other characters, but, like, he remains a man of mystery so good I do want to say I'm enjoying very much this panel of uh, Maxine jabbing her toe in Malcolm's eye Yep. the, that, the, the pet name gag is pretty good too <laughs> dude these pet names are over the top I love it <laughs> it's good it's, very, it's good because it's very much a Malcolm and Maxine thing like I don't think any other characters in the book have engaged in that kind of you know I just think these two, whether you love the sex stuff or not, by the way, appreciate Malcolm's Canadian boxers. Yes. The You're man's all repping. in. <laughs> He's all in. But uh, whether you like the sex stuff or not, you have to appreciate these two as a couple. Yep. Like, just, they're a great couple, dude. And Smup. Smup is not going to be a sound effect to join the lexicon of recurring sound effects. From the book that gave us Brappalorch, Brackabadoom, Sput, now we have Smup. Huh. <laughs> Put it on a pile. Well, you know what I imagine that sound is? It's like a plunger hitting porcelain. That's exactly it, dude. That's exactly it. You nailed it. Like, something like that, you know? Yes. I can't do it. Can't do it without. I need some porcelain. (laughs) It's so good. I think it's funny, um, a recurring theme in the book is that Malcolm and Maxine have the reality TV show going on in their life, 
And uh, something that has been repeatedly played with is the notion that they're going to fuck up and do something in front of the cameras that they shouldn't. Like, 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 like tell them that their kids are all from different mothers. <laughs> yeah. Or, like, you know, like, she's making the joke about the pubic hair in her braces, but, like, it's kind of funny because, like, you know, that would instantly tie Jack to Angel, which would tie Malcolm to his sister, which would be, you know, of course, problems in the world. <laughs> so, I don't know, I'm just saying, I like that with uh, without lay- leaning on it too heavy, like, we kind of have that continued element of danger with the reality TV show of seeing something that it shouldn't, you know what I mean? So, Crawfish here's got a bit of a Hitler stash. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, that's an indicator. Yeah. It's a surefire sign you're evil. Not much, I mean, this page is just more of uh, just explaining who this guy is and giving him some background information. It's great to uh, frame him by comparing him to Frankenstein or Steve Jobs. (laughs) Like, you know, it's a good dude. Love it. Love any any of those panels of those two talking about it. It's good. Good. Again, good slow buildup to the scourge reveal. Like just say like, I never go that quietly. It's just so good, dude. Everyone was on edge just to be around him. Like, that's great. That's good build-up, you know? This action, this sweet sewer action is great. What are these, more demonoids? Yep, looks like the demonoid problem is not going away. Getting worse. Getting worse, these demonoids. Moving up north. (laughs) Malcolm, having his head held under sewage. (laughs) Plop! But I I think it's hilarious, too, the... uh, I think, see, this is the thing, is, all right, you can hate the sex, but the thing is, is it's, cre- it's creating bizarre situations. And for instance, here's this bizarre dynamic where Malcolm says he can't stick it to Angel because even with Maxine right there, he feels like he's cheating. Right. Which is, again, it's just kind of funny, just the problems that can create, like, again, like, it's not just gratuitous. It'd be one thing if it was like gratuitous and then went nowhere. Right. But I think having the three kids around shows that like the stuff that happens in this book has repercussions and goes places and creates issues and stuff. Yep. And like here you clearly have like Angel laying it out pretty bluntly that like, you know, she was uh, looking to hook up, you know, with Malcolm. <laughs> And, Mac- and Malcolm's not so down on it. He's, like, not so keen. Like, despite the thing, he's not really into the menage a trois aspect of it. It's good. I think it's interesting. I think it justifies it. And then we get Kettle Corn's uh, wrath. Are we sure it's Kettle Corn? Well, it's the... Pu- yeah, boots. Look at his boots at the end. And so it ends. The little fish scale leggings. No, I'm... You're assuming that Kettlecorn is Scourge. Oh. Oh, shit. I'm just saying it's not a sure thing. Well, you blew my mind a little bit. I suppose there's no true indicator that it's him. They did say that the company had a few idea men, though nothing like him. I'm going to say that I feel like, though, before you throw that chestnut out there to cook, that uh, Scourge says, the rules have ended my career, taken my business, destroyed my life. Okay. I feel like that nails it down to him. Okay. Yep, you're right. going to say, I, I, first you were blowing my mind, but then I was like, wait a minute feel like Scourge makes it explicitly clear that he is kettle corn crawfish. I agree. Now that I read that text again. You see, here's the thing, Jim. I'm not a smart man. I'm just saying dog monster from junkyard dog monster from last issue. Take a look at what we got here in the free at last panel. Yep. Dog monster. Junkyard dog man. 
And I like that guy behind him. Yep. Give that guy a cool costume and a cool name, and you've got a recurring... I was moderately confused, because... Alright, so first two panels, we see the laboratories themselves get attacked... Coom choom. Second two panels, we see the 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 guy the the guy and the woman from previously. Yep. Getting in those next two panels, getting skeletoned. Skeletized. But then we have a panel with the side of the building getting blasted. We have another, and then we have a panel of the other uh, office workers we saw getting attacked, but not necessarily killed. But then it cuts back to the wall that was just blasted, and we see the animals escape. And then we see the skeletons of the office workers from two panels ago. I was uh, mo- I was moderately confused that he had shown the animals escaping and then nuking the animals until I really looked at the positioning of the skeletons closely between the other two panels. I do agree. And in fact, I'm going to just confess that I didn't realize that... Uh, here's what I realized. I realized that he hadn't... I realized he wasn't killing the animals. But... I had not realized, because it didn't make sense to me. I was like, well, at first I too read it that way. I was like, oh shit, he let the animals loose and then just killed them? What the hell? Seems that, seemed like like a waste. A, that seemed like a dick move, but okay. Yeah. But uh, I realized then that he wasn't killing those animals. I just did not realize until you literally just said it that the oh no no foom panel is actually followed up directly by the Krakow panel. Right. So yeah, that is kind of a. Uh, it's kind just, of a it's just weird that he went consecutive panel, consecutive moments to splitting them up suddenly. Yes, I don't know. I if it just, maybe it just looked better in layouts because if uh, I don't know if you put the if you put the the, the Thum and the Krakow panels next to each other, mm-hmm. they'd be on different 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 uh, line uh, different um a, a, a different I don't know I don't know. I'm not an artist. <laughs> I get what you're saying. It, uh, it does create a uh, sort of a uh, rhythm, a different rhythm. I, I want to say that uh, I appreciate that he went to the trouble to make recurring gene tech lab. Uh, just, <laughs> you know, again, just for this issue, just for these sequences. But uh, you see the people running from the uh, Thum explosion were also shown earlier. In the They Are Breathing Easier Now panel. Right. I'm just saying I appreciate that uh, we had recurring uh, gene tech employees. Uh, we didn't have to, but it's a nice little touch. Yep. Well, they're all dead. <laughs> yeah, they're fucking dead now, though, right? <laughs> so, uh, awesome as shit. I think it's funny that they uh, mentioned the uh, demonoids uh, in Chicago. I wonder if anything is going to come of that. Uh... Angel says, the, is that demonoid family uh, that you rounded up when you were a cop still in jail? And he goes, yeah, I guess. Unless they got thrown into Dimension X. Right. Yeah, just kind of a funny, kind of a funny aside. I like the uh, C Savage Dragon two twelve box. Yeah, I love oh, those. Yeah. I'm always going to support that. And then we get some more of what I like. No, I'm <laughs> yes, the scourge is cool. <laughs> yeah, the scourge is cool. No, dude. How about let's stop before we talk about the awesome shower sex scene, which I know you want to go into. Yes, in, in detail. How about for a fucking awesome first appearance how bad ass is this splash page of scourge pretty good yeah. I, i'm sure eric's gonna love drawing all those uh fish scales you know what i hope he never scales it back never dials it back keep those scales coming baby yeah he's fun he's got a big gaping maw and a tattered cloak He's, like, visual. he's got a lot a lot of interesting design elements going on. Yeah, and I think I'm gonna say um iconic. <coughs> oh that scared the shit out of me. You sounded like you got attacked. Yeah. <coughs> you know what? <coughs> I think I'm allergic to pork. 
That's not every, every thing. time I eat pork, I get real stuffed up. It seems to be an actual thing that's happening to me. Weird. You didn't get any tick bites recently, did you? That's a no. That's, that's steak. Oh, okay, okay. That's red meat. Okay. That's okay. alpha gel. That's a whole thing. Does that mean you can eat pepperoni? I mean... Bacon? I mean, I do. Is it, it all pork products? It, it really just seems to be pork chops. Pork chops. It's very, like I said, it's very odd. I mean, I eat lots of ham. I was going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's something else you're putting on the roast. You should keep this in the fin cast, by the way. Don't cut this out. <laughs> I'm not. I'm sure... <laughs> I'm sure this medical emergency is fascinating by the by the by, by the listeners. This is a savage ham cast. <laughs> savage ham cast. Oh, beware scourge, beware world. So good, love it. I'm sure he'll get killed next issue. No, dude, no. I feel like this guy's going to go the distance, and what's more, I feel like this guy is going to organize, which is. If you want guys to recur, that's what you need. You need an organizer. And I feel like this guy's going to organize. He's got, I don't want to jump ahead too much, but he's got all the reasons to organize against Malcolm. True. So good. So the best part about this shower sequence is how it's a payoff of the the sewer sequence. They are just talking about the fact that having sex with Angel is like cheating on Maxine and Malcolm's real uncomfortable about it. Mm-hmm. Boom. <laughs> Anal? I would assume, although, you know, he could be scooping up from the... He could be scooping up from the bottom. Yeah, I, I want to say I appreciate the nipple... The nipple grabbing. Oh, yeah, that's going on. That's good. And furthermore, can I just say... That, like, what's great, again, you're talking about, like, a narrative payoff, is that, like, Malcolm's not really, like, super into it. This, again, happens at Maxine's behest. Like, they were totally just going to take separate showers, and Maxine was like, oh, yeah, let's let's fucking do it. I think, uh... Not Malcolm hair... looking for any excuse to get out. <laughs> Did the, uh, fucking... Angel wearing the schoolgirl outfit is hilarious. <laughs> Not cut to her dimensions, I'm afraid. No, I, 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 I'm thinking, but like, look at Maxine's face, like in that middle panel. <laughs> that bowl yeah. cut. The, her, she's, the, we were talking about this earlier. That her, her haircut has changed just ever so slightly here. Yeah, dude. makes her look real. <laughs> Real bowl cut. <laughs> yeah, I love it, dude. <laughs> Maxine, to me, uh, every time she's on page, I'm laughing. I'm fucking cracking up. Just fucking, like, from her hilarious, like, fucking nerdy hair, nerdy looking hairstyle to, like, you know, her putting Angel in the costume. Like, it's just fucking hilarious, dude. And also, Meat Pocket is a hilarious pet name. That's just funny, dude. How bold is Malcolm to hold his tiny little cell phone in the shower like that? <laughs> I just love the giant, his giant hands and that tiny cell phone. Well, is it, that is kind of weird, though, because his head's not huge. Just his hands. Yeah. Gotta hold that. Look, hold, look. Like, I'm just saying, like, appreciate, if you will, dear, dear listener. Hands are hard, okay? A lot of people don't excel at hands. Look at, like, the the body language on the hands reaching for the phone. Like, you know, all delicate style. <laughs> With the, the little middle grip out, like, the fingers up. So good, dude. Uh, they spring into action, and they start, they go to fight Scourge, and Scourge is just tearing fucking shit up, blowing what up is, helicopters. Let's blow up these helicopters. So awesome, dude. He's Scourge. murdering people. He is skeletonizing and ripping people in half. He ain't playing around. Guy is fucking probably not originally Canadian. He doesn't say A once. <laughs> yeah, he's just too mean. Just too mean. He is. He's Canada's. He's Canada's greatest villain. He's mean. <laughs> he's got a mean bone in his body. 
Swam is fantastic. All the lettering is fantastic. We always praise, like, Farron Delgado. The coloring is fucking fantastic. Like, just whether we're talking about, like, the details on the sewer, uh, like, the sewage on them when they come out of that scene, or, like, just how the, you know, explosions and stuff look on the uh, scene where he's attacking Gene Tech. Like, just coloring is fucking on point. Lettering's so on point. This action sequence is great. It's because they're, like, just jumping around and just beating the... They're just, like, jumping up to Scourge, who can fly. And they're just, like, jumping up and tagging him. So good, dude. It's pretty tough when you're dealing with the flying people. (laughs) They just move out of the way. So good, dude. Anytime there's the uh, four-page four page grid of action, like, you know, it's always going to be good stuff. And Angel is just kicking so much ass. Like, I don't know. I'm just saying I'm really glad to, you know, have, like, just, like, another pow- super powerful character. Like, it's not just Malcolm's show, you know. Like, Angel's fucking awesome. Although... Well, enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> yeah. frack a I just... And again, talking about like establishing a powerful villain. Well, here's this is always my this has always been my worry. You got this villain who you hear very clearly is is burning people to their skeletons mm-hmm. with like no effort. And then you right. get a character like Maxine whose only power really establishes is that she is strong. And when she's it's been shown multiple times that they don't have she doesn't have like like toughness. He means Angel, dear listener. Did I say, what did I say? You said Maxine. Whoopsie. It's fine, no big deal. Keep going, roll, roll. So at any point, they can, like, lose limbs, and that's the end. Yeah. And now she got flash fried. Oh, dude, she's so fucking dead looking. Look at that fucking panel, dude. Her face is yeah, mutilated. Yeah, her lower, her lower jaw is just detached. The fucking arm is gone, like, oof. Oh, yeah, she did lose an arm. Yeah, arm so, obliterated. So that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this has kind of been something I've been waiting to happen for like, like ten years. Is that she's going to get into a fight with someone and get out and just get get backhanded to death? And honestly, like. So the only sort of jump in the gun here a little bit, the only indicator at all that we have that she might be okay is the shit with Smasher popping out of the grave. That's the only well, indicator. There's two. That 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 that's correct. The uh, okay. the grave thing definitely could have. Maybe they have until now unrevealed regenerative capabilities. Okay. Because up until now, neither of them have been mortally wounded for whatever reason. Or, there's also the indicator of what the cover of the next issue is all about. Shh, elaborate. What are you talking about? It's the one where Malcolm's looking at the crowd and they're all reaching towards him and it's they're out for blood. Oh, yeah, you would assume Malcolm would make sense. Because, you know, it's easy to forget, but uh, he is romantically... In, in love with Angel too. Sure, but no, I'm saying is that it's been established in the last two issues that you just inject her with some chosen bl- bl- chosen one blood, hit her with the freak out, bingo bango, fixed Angel. Well, well, that's what I mean is that he, um, you know how he went crazy to save Maxine, right? I feel like he would, if he could, go just as berserk to try and save Angel just as quick. Of course, uh, his situation uh, this time is a little bit in pieces oh yeah way more dire um i I just want to stop before we jump too much to the end uh i do love that like immediately like as soon as angel gets flash fried you know malcolm whips out the electricity like the lightning right like it's fucking great because like i don't know man i mean he obviously wasn't playing around but like you know they're just sort of jumping up and punching him the minute he kills angel or you know fucking nukes her face like, immediately Malcolm starts getting, like, way more, like, you know, just fucking ass-kicking in general. I'll kill you! Just such great action, like, you know. Uh, and then, yeah, boom, there goes his bottom half. I think it's cool. It's a cool little detail. I I was sort of like, 
looking at Scourge's forearm, you know, that little weird gray patch and stuff. And they even addresses it. He's like, you know, his circuitry is exposed. It's cool that Scourge has made a suit. You know, it's true he made a suit. But mad mad scientist bastard that he is, he made his suit to look like just a monster. Yeah. Like, it's a robot suit that he is in, but, like, the robot suit is, like, his body. Or, like, looks like... It doesn't look robotic like Overlord is what I'm trying to say. I hear you. Like, instead, like, he made a suit, but, like... Because when I first saw Scourge, I thought, what is he, like, made himself genetically into a fucking purple, like, brute, like, monster? But no, dude, he's, like, a guy in a suit, just like Overlord. It's just he made his suit, like, a fucking evil looking demon monster thing. <laughs> which is cool because here's a cool thing as cool as scourge's design looks if that's just a suit technically there's no reason that he can't upgrade and like look even cooler or change his appearance you mean like like when he goes to fix his armor come he comes back looking a little different yeah like imagine he's like his arm okay so malcolm broke his arm this time right yeah so imagine, like, next time we see a Scourge, like, he's got, like, fucking just, like, even bigger arms. Or his arms have spikes on the forearm or something like that. Uh-huh. I'm just saying it's cool. It's a cool wrinkle. What I appreciate is that Scourge appeared in this issue, and immediately you get the This Is Canada's Overlord vibes. Or you get, I get strong Overlord vibes, I guess, with all the blasting people with the hand blast. You get strong Overlord vibes. Oh, yeah. That's a, that's a good indicator that you're an overlord. <laughs> but immediately, this guy is different. In, in, in key ways, immediately he's different. Well, he likes to get into, he gets into dust-ups a lot more than Overlord ever did. Yeah. But on top of that, like, you know, just the fucking wild idea to build your suit to look like a fucking, like, guy, like, muscles and shit. Right. And uh, I'm curious, Jim, tell me what you thought. What was going on here? When Malcolm breaks his arm, is that Scourge's suit reacting, or is that Malcolm lightning blasting him? I think his suit, like, uh, wait, Shiraka Zack? Hmm. Scourge yells gah, so I assume that it was Malcolm lightning blasting him. But I, didn't I mean, know it's blue. Sure. That's usually an indicator of lightning. Yeah, yeah. But we see him leaving the scene, mm-hmm. crackling with lightning. Yeah, that's what that's what confused me too. I was like, oh, but it kind of seems like the suit is kind of malfunctioning. I think his suit malfunctioned and overloaded. And what we're seeing is basically what normally would be like an invisible flight energy field mm-hmm. is just going crazy out of control because it's uh, whatever controls it is out of out of whack. Or just like, you know, lightning just trailing behind him as his suit fails. Yeah. But I think it is a suit, not Malcolm. Okay, okay. I just was curious. I want to say, too, uh, possibly, teensiest, tiniest glimpse at Heroic Dong. The (laughs) the fabled... (laughs) Oh, right, because it got incinerated. Yeah, it looks Scrack a Zack. Look real close. Scrack a Zack? Oh, oh, Yeah, yeah. Real close. Like, I feel like it's the tiniest hint. I don't know. Those could be leg stubs. <laughs> well, I mean, I see the leg stubs, but I'm saying his legs are kicked back. But, like, look right there in the middle. Uh, right there. <laughs> I just see exposed torso. I'm yeah, afraid. Nah, I'm just being dumb. Um, no, this fight was great, dude. This was great. I feel like this is some of the most ass-kicking we've seen Malcolm do. Yep. And... At the same time, I feel like this is some of the most he's had his ass kicked. I mean, that, 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 that punch, um, how do I describe this? One page from the last page, mm-hmm. second to the last page, uh, okay. fourth panel. Yeah. Getting caught, punched into the wall. Thum, thum. Yeah, that's a, that's a real good, good, yeah. good punch. Yeah, dude, that's just so good. Just the body language on him, like, leaning into that punch. I want to say I feel like this was, like, a breakthrough issue just for, like, Malcolm coming off just as badass and kick-ass as his old man. Yep. So good, dude. Because, like, the lightning power's got a time to, like, shine and, like, just so much action. So good, dude. 
Yeah, fucking this was a kick-ass issue. Oh, my God. Scourge flies off. Leaves, leaves fucking those two dead as shit almost, I guess. Or we'll see. What do you think? We're, it's time, I think, a survival rating guess is in order. What do you think is the survival rating? Obviously, we know Malcolm lives. For now. He's on several covers after this. I, I think I think Angel's going to live. Do you really? Yeah, I do. I don't think she's dead. I think her just she's just hurt real bad right now. It isn't going to be like a... I don't think it's going to be like a Maxine situation where she actually goes to heaven or something. I think, think I just all I think all the skins just burn off her face and her arms been burned off. Do you think uh, that she'll be mutilated in future issues? That would be a change of pace. People don't get mutilated a lot in Savage Dragon. They usually just fucking die. Yeah. I don't know. I'm very interested. A thing you and Craig said last time we were talking. See, so okay, you had the two characters. You got the parallels. So Smasher also had her face burn off. Yes. And uh, that is Angel... an inter- that is an interesting uh, uh, coincidence. Yeah. If so it's a coincidence. Maybe they can only heal their faces. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like uh, well, you guys brought up uh, maybe Michael Jackson's <sighs> healing factor in some way playing a part here. I mean, very well. I mean, I don't think Angel had sex with Michael. She spe- specific- That's what I'm saying. She specifically said she didn't. But she did pr- probably have sex with Malcolm in this issue. Oh, well. But that was literally <laughs> five minutes ago. So I don't think there's enough time for her to have a baby in her. E- even chosen one babies don't grow that fast. And I guess we have uh, seen it established that Chosen One babies do not necessarily heal their mothers. Well, we don't know that for sure yet. We don't know for sure, but I'm saying, like, uh, when... Because we've had uh, no... I don't can't recall a, a situation where a mother with a Chosen One baby was critically injured. Uh, Tyrone smashed right out of his mom's gut. But he attached the umbilical cord immediately when he craw- crawled out. Ooh, good call. So they stopped sharing blood immediately. Oh, good call. Shit. Because the whole okay, point, dude. the whole point of my theory is that they're connected by the umbilical cord. They yeah, share you're... blood, yep, as right. babies and mothers do. Yep. No, I'm with you. The science of it, I'm following your science on that exactly. And what's funny is I never thought of it. So that's fucking yeah. You might be onto something. Oh, I don't know, dude. That's crazy. I have no idea. That like is you never. My theory. You're, you're thinking old. I think someone else, someone else else had a theory that the hand busting out was just the baby's hand. Ooh, yeah, possibly. I don't know, dude. I, I'm just saying, like, it's Savage Dragon. Anything can happen. I super duper don't want uh, Angel to die, but we don't know. <laughs> Alpha Blood suggests that Malcolm will try to revive her with uh, his, yeah. his own blood. So, and then hit her with some freak out, and then it causes a scene, and then we go from there. But, uh, hell, you never know. I gotta Almost. wonder if that would take away her powers, though. Ooh. Because she's, she's, right. mu- she's a mutant. Her powers developed when she became a teenager. You're 100% I'm not, right. Sh- I'm not actually... Sh- cause does that count as, like, a natural power? Is that her natural state? I don't think so, because if you remember, Negate was able to negate Smasher. That's that's true. She, yeah, that's true. And yep, she, and- she would be a mutant as well. Her powers would have come to her as an adult. Yep. So, technically... If he hits Angel with freak out, he's going to make her a normal person. Oh, geez. <laughs> they talk about a shift in dynamic in the book. We'll see how it goes. That, that would be a pretty crazy change, because that would pretty much end her ass-kicking days. Yes. Unless she gets some kind of, like, put her in the paint. Put her in the scourge armor. <laughs> make no attempts to feminize it. Just to have Angel in that scourge armor. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Oh, that's good, dude. That's One good. issue at a time. So good. It's exciting. I loved it. I give this issue a 10 out of 10. Yeah. I mean, I know. I'll, I'll give it a 10 out of 10. It's definitely one of the best issues of the, of the last few good ones. It's. Uh, I know I get criticized for liking every issue, but I mean... It just I don't like every it's, issue. 
Yeah. That's well, it, has, it has been a while so, since I abjectly detested one. <laughs> I want to praise, uh, throw a shout out to my man, Simon Malit St. Pierre, <laughs> for his pinup in this one fun little story. Uh, 200 issues ago to the issue. Oh, right. I recall that. He had a pinup in Savage Dragon. Uh, would have been 37. And so he did this pinup for this issue 200 issues later. And uh, kind of like what he was talking about with the Blood Strike. Like, it's just cool you just, these, like, to be in this book, you just get to know and meet these people and these recurring names and see this stuff like that. It's just cool, man. It's cool. This backup, Jim, what do you think about this Save the Future backup? Fun, fun stuff. Um, apparently this was supposed to run back during the Trump issue. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think it works here just fine. I mean, there's no reason you can't have a, a backup that's a flashback. I agree as it, well. It, it's not like it changes anything. Especially when we're talking about time travel. And especially when the payoff for the time travel story is exactly what this one was. So, yeah, uh, there was some talk of, eh, it was supposed to run earlier, but it's like, man, it's not any less, it's not any less effective running now. Like, I thought it was good. When, like the when, we're, when we're done, I got to show you something. Okay. That's kind of funny to me. Okay. But, uh, well, uh, we'll, get, we'll do that after the show. It has nothing to do with the show. Okay. <laughs> Is it a funny, uh, funny cat video? No, no, it's, um... I'll tell you later. Oh, it's, it, 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 it's about this comic and something that I did, like, once. All right. When I uh, travel through time to kill <laughs> President Clinton. Well, you know, you didn't do a very good job. I didn't. I do like, I appreciate that the uh, female that's out to kill uh, Hillary, uh, she has cable eye. Yep, she does. <laughs> I, I like that a lot. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Because apparently in the future, that's a thing you're going to get. I like the art a lot on this one. Uh, I thought the art was really, really good. Uh, especially the fact that uh, he nailed the likenesses for Trump and Clinton really good. He did. <laughs> nailed the shit out of them. And anytime the punch uh, punchline is, no matter who wins, we lose. That's yeah, that's good. See, who that. says this comic takes sides? <laughs> yeah, they're both was, they're both awful. That's what's so funny is that like when it ran on Bleeding Cool is, well, assassin goes back in time to kill Trump. Like that was the headline they chose, but it's like clearly that was clickbait because the even kill was that both candidates were you know on the chopping block, and then the punchline mocks both candidates. I'm just saying. Don't get your feelings hurt, people. <laughs> it's only it's only comics. And we got a couple of funnies. Golly weepers. Time to talk about some funnies, guys. Uh, um, Average Dragon sort of returns. A Virgil's Bar. Love it. Fun, fun, fun times. I used to sleep on top of him. <laughs> I appreciate it. I think it paid off. Uh, I love draw brand and draw. Got to appreciate that, Dom. Dude, oh, that's hilarious. You can't see it, but I have my thumb up right now. <laughs> Dear listener, for the listeners, Jim has a very penile thumb. He's exposed it right now for the punchline. <laughs> no, dude, it's it's hilarious because like you know tips tips i saw you staring at my cleavage is funny enough but then just the guy the guy with his dick out like <laughs> and like the guy's all begrudgingly like he tips in both jars <laughs> oh it's good stuff dude i didn't quite follow moonbeard you know it was, it's pretty clear to me explain it i'm stupid the guy's black and white he uh-huh. says he wants the New Year's going to be different, so he switches to color, and he's immediately put off by it, and so he goes back to his old ways, Okay, saying that, that next year things will be different. That's what I thought, but 
I just wasn't sure because of the reliance on color to sell the joke. Oh. I just kind of was like, huh. I think that's what it's trying to say. It's a meta but... joke about coloring. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I, I, uh, it just didn't immediately land, uh, you know, I wasn't sure. I just wanted to make sure. Man, listen, I'm established. I'm a stupid person. It's fine. It's fine. I get confused. And then we close this beautiful masterpiece issue with some more Chris G. Like, dragon, like, cuties. It's great, dude. Fun stuff. Uh, your print issue, there must be a barcode. There is. In one of those spots. There is. Because it's just empty on mine. Oh, it's just empty? Yeah. Yeah. Holy shit, dude. Good issue. Wow. Wow. Me- Those are some meaty potatoes, my dude. <laughs> and we ain't done. Oh, no. We got a little extra. A little, uh... We got some dinner. more Ninja Turtle Urban Legends by Fosco and Carlson. Let's, yeah. uh... Let's, let's get through this relatively quickly. Because we've been yeah. running strangely long. And there's not a lot to say about it anyway. Turtles honestly. fight ninja ladies. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Pretty much. Le- hey. Leo's lost while uh, in astral form. Splinter gets a bath. <laughs> I gotta say, Splinter and this, uh, this, um, this, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Komodo guy. He's got a hilariously not Asian enough name. Yeah. He is Go Komodo. Um, it's fun that him and Splinter actually get along, that they aren't just... Yeah. Because I, I thought it was funny just sort of... Splinter's on the... The scene with the Splinter's on the table getting uh, getting looked at with the machines, and then the very next scene he's presenting himself to his kidnapper, and they're getting <laughs> yeah. along smashingly. Yeah, it's, it's the age, man. He's wise. He knows he doesn't just have to go off just kicking fucking ass, although he does. Although he does. <laughs> But uh, what's beautiful is this uh, little origin recap uh, very clearly makes it, it makes it plain, we've established it several times, Yeah. but uh, it makes it plain that uh, this is post, like this is direct continuation of Ninja Turtles, yep. Mirage Ninja Turtles. Yep. How about those Twin Towers in New York? That isn't the only anachronism in this issue. There's, <laughs> a, there's a really wonderful uh, reference to both... Um, Fuck! I had this <laughs> joke ready to go. <laughs> That's almost as funny. <laughs> um, damn it! It's right here. Here, <laughs> finally! Thank God. Okay. A dated references abound oh. with not oh, only love Babe Watch but also Barb Wire. I'm so glad. The culturally that. relevant duo. It never ends. Like I, when I when I read that, I was like, "Oh, that is so good." <laughs> Baywatch and Barb Wire, fantastic, dude. Yeah, they just keep talking about what babes these ninjas are. <laughs> Baywatch and, and Barb Wire, fantastic. I do have to say, uh, we were beating up on the coloring a little bit last time. I really like the lighting effects um, in the graveyard when the helicopters uh, shining the light on the boys. That's good. I well, think that's successful. Well, at the same time, I'll say that some of the uh, the uh, the um, bathing scenes, mm-hmm. especially the second page, there's like a lot of like empty space. I, I don't know. Splinter looks a little weird. Oh, when colored. Yeah. He's like, he's like, he's, he's a lot of thin line work going on with him. And I feel like it would look better in black and white with the, with the white background. Yeah. I don't know. No, I, I, I agree. Uh, there's also other little things, you know, we talked about it. Like, yeah, you know, we, we really super hope that they do a black and white collection eventually. Like they'll never think, do it. Oh, please do you bastards. I'm just saying, I feel like, like if you look at the panel where, all the uh, just opposite of the bathing scene, right after the bathing scene, where like there's the silhouette in the middle, and we were, um, I think that like the colorist went in and put the floor there. That makes sense. Whereas black and white, you know, there was no floor there, and I think that panel works a little bit better without the floor. 
you know, behind it. When you say the floor... The, the color-only floor. Oh, I see what you're saying. So the yeah. panel above it would have been a blank white space as well? Yeah. So the, the, the silhouettes would be all throughout the white areas of the floor. Bingo. All right, and, if you look at, and if you look at the way the black has framed it, like the black has framed that panel to be a bigger panel like underneath those. That would probably be full white in a black and white issue. Yeah, and it just would have looked visually, yeah. I think, cooler a little bit. But I still think the coloring shines in places here. Uh, like I said, I mentioned the headlights and the high beams. and I think it's kind of, again, it is funny how quickly okay Splinter is with his captor. And also his captor's bizarre plan to kidnap and study humanoid animals so that he can unleash his own yeah. humanoid animal dragon form. He very much wants to be a Komodo dragon. Yeah. It's a little worrisome. Yeah. You're already named Go Komodo and surround yourself with giant Komodo dragons. No, he no. He just wants to be one. He's the Elon Musk of Komodo dragons. Well, remember, in the cartoon Turtles, uh, Splinter is a human who becomes a rat. Mm-hmm. But in comic Turtles, it's always the the animals who take on human characteristics. Yep. I don't think there are too many mutations that go from uh, human to animal. That but, is correct. Yeah, no, Basher Stockman isn't a fly in this. and hmm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it goes just one way. Pretty much. Speaking of other ties to the actual uh, comic Turtles, there's this whole flying car bit, which uh, ties into previous adventures. Yeah. Because it's, uh, it's an alien flying car. It's one of the uh, Triceraton. Uh, right. The, the, tri- the, you know, the Triceratops aliens who are the mm-hmm. absolute awesome. Oh, yeah. They're the best visual design ever. Oh, yeah, dude. Triceratops, man. I mean, that's a home run. <laughs> flying cars are fun. But uh, Mako looks cool here. I think Mako is a cool visual. Like, he's just so much bigger than Splinter. Oh, he's huge. And ripped, and, apparently. Yeah. Jacked. So, Got like super a cool. jigsaw going on for abs. Just like the drool. Like the super drooly. Like he's been drawn super dribbly drooly. So, it's good, dude. Jigsaw for abs. Yeah, his abs are a little uh, wacky. It's like a, Got those... There's like a face. <laughs> like squint at it like slightly sideways. He's got like a nose and like an eye and an eyebrow. No, I see it, it's dude. It's like Megatron. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's got some wacky looking abs for sure. I think uh, that uh, panel, that final panel of like uh, the turtle skeleton with the busted up shell. Yep. Is uh, still pretty shocking. <laughs> it's still pretty good. Got a pretty good idea what happened though, but yeah. Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm just saying that's a, that's a good visual. It's still still effective. So, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm digging it. Like I said, again, as a uh, person who's never read this, that's uh, that's landing with me pretty well. Uh, I chose the Mako uh, cover over the new cover because, you know, Savage Dragon reasons. Yep. And uh, I was pleased. I give it a uh, 8 out of 10. I'll agree with that assessment. Yeah. I did enjoy this issue. So, uh... Take us home, Raven. Yeah, let's do it. See, you know, we're so, prefer- we're so professional and prepared here on the Savage Fincast. Type faster. <laughs> exactly. Google search the hell out of that. <laughs> we're so, you know, we, we praise ourselves on being a uh, tight-knit operation that you'll never even realize. You're, you're, you're clueless. You're so in the dark that I had to just bring that up. But it's cool because... Savage Dragon 238, Blood Hunters. When word gets out about the healing properties of Malcolm Dragon's blood, the world comes knocking at his door looking for a cure. Every person with a catastrophic disease, every desperate family member, every doctor hoping to bring back salvation descends on Toronto seeking Dragon's blood. But though the demand is great, the source is infinite. (laughs) Infinite? That's wrong. That is the 100% wrong word to read right there. It sources f- finite. You know what? That's what fucked me up. I'm just going to pause. Pause this copy. Finite, but infinite. That doesn't... Isn't that weird? Wait, say it again. The pronunciation's finite. Finite. But infinite. 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 
infinite. You don't say infinite. In oh, I do. Do you? It's one of those learning to speak by reading things that I did. You say infinite? I used to. Well, fucking, you might be the only one saying it right. Well, here's, well. here's one that's fun. Catastrophic and catastrophe. Oh yeah, jeez, yeah. What am I acting like? That's a special. Or case. as I used to pronounce it. Oh, can I even remember how I used to pronounce it? Catastrophic. I'd have to actually look at the word. Hold on. A second. I guess you would say catastrophic. Cata. Oh, no, I, or I would say catastrophic. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Cata- catastrophic. Catastrophic is what I used to say in my head. You can hardly be blamed. The effects of this cure are often horrific. I gotta say, the effects of this cure are often horrific. Well, yeah, we are you, talking you, about often, exploding. You explode every time. They're not often. <laughs> they always are horrific. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or you get reduced to some prior state, which might not be desirable. But uh, yeah, it's kind of this is kind of if if we're to like read into this copy, it's kind of if I had to say the world catches wind of this, I have to say Malcolm's reality show catches wind that makes of sense. the cure and then the world would know but uh, yeah blood hunters dude excited september 12th right around the corner too good lord so well still mostly a month away right, right around that corner I'm gonna stick to my guns right around the corner <laughs> all right good. excited so yeah um, I guess we found, even though it was just the two of us, I think we found plenty enough to talk about. Oh, it was not catastrophic at all. Not catastrophic at all. Catastrophic. Yeah. It, no, it was good. I think we had a good, uh, hopefully, dear listeners, you agree. But I think we did just... Well, you know what? I think it might say catastrophe. No. Catastroph- I don't know. There, there was some weird thing. It was a long time ago. I, pronounce Pronouncing words wrong is a fun hobby of mine. <laughs> it's fine. Or... Impro- or adding emphasis in the wrong place in the sentence. Emphasis on the wrong syllable. Yes. And syllable is a fun one. <laughs> syllable. Syllable. <laughs> syllable. <laughs> Good. Make dude. a whole this show is, about that. This is a perfect end cap. Perfect end cap. Thank you for listening, dear listeners. And yep. we'll see you next time. Next time on the Science Fit. Ha, ha, ha.